Welcome to Worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. I'm Amy Pop, and I'm the credentialed religious educator with this congregation. In recognition of Monday as Indigenous Peoples Day, I offer this land recognition from Sean Neil Barron. We gather today as a community of seekers to honor the interdependence of life, to respect the dignity of all, and to honor the land we walk humbly upon. Friends, let us acknowledge that we walk upon the traditional territories of the Peoria people, the original nation of this land. We are blessed with a space and opportunity to strive to live out our common principles, to bring justice, equity, and compassion into our daily lives, and to resist all that threatens the earth and her people, to live out our dream of a world community of peace, liberty, and justice for all. If you're new to this congregation, I invite you to help us get to know you. At the end of this service will be the link for our coffee hour on Zoom. All are invited to the conversation. Please send a note to the church office for more information. This congregation is sustained by the care, talents, and generous gifts of our members and friends. If you would like to make a financial gift, see the link in the chat or the slide at the end of the service. For our special announcement, I have a reminder of our change in worship for October 25th. Sunday worship on October 25th will be at 10 a.m. instead of 10.30. We are joining with Unitarian Universalist congregations from across the state for a democracy revival. Information about how to watch the service will be shared as soon as possible. Our congregation will have its own coffee hour as usual. Now, let us enter into worship. Come, the fount of every blessing, tune our hearts to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. While the hope of life's perfection fills our hearts with joy and love, teach us ever to be faithful. May we still thy goodness prove. Come, thou fount of every vision, lift our eyes to what may come. See the lion and the young lamb dwell together in thy home. Hear the cries of war fall silent, feel our love glow like the sun. When we all serve one another, then our heaven is begun. Come the fount of inspiration, turn our Show the promise of this day. Help us find ourselves in union. Help our hands tell of our love. With thy need, O fount of justice, earth be fair as above. Good morning. I'm Joyce Rosenberger. This meditation is by Reverend Gretchen Haley. Today is a gift. This moment right here is a gift, offering itself to us, ready for our response. It is not easy to receive a gift, it turns out. We want to fuss and feign resistance and say, don't worry about me, I'm fine. Try to give something in return. Oh, you shouldn't have try to earn our right for such an overwhelming thing to be thrust into our laps. Here, at least let me do the cleanup, but no. This day is ours. You didn't earn it, I didn't earn it. We didn't make it. Yet, here it is. This is how life is. And so we come together to say, wow, and thank you, and let's do what we can to have more of this life. 
For this hour, let us sing out in praise, granting ourselves silence, listening to the sound of our hearts, beating, leaning into this gift of life, listening to where it is calling us next. My friends, we have gathered. It is good. Let us pass this blessing on. Come, let us worship together. Words for our chalice lighting are space for greater expectation by Soul Matters worship team. May the time we share today make space for greater expectation. May the truth we learned yesterday be changed by what we hear today. May the fear that seems so certain be loosened by a newfound trust. May our doubts and disappointments be replaced by an ever unfolding faith in more beauty, more trust, more joy, more goodness, more life. Good morning. Today we're talking about expectations. Often we try to shape our world to match our expectations, especially when it comes to what we feel is most important in life. Today's story shares how we might go along our journey in a different way. It is called The Wandering Teacher. Once upon a time, there was a teacher who was known far and wide as one who had mastered all the great disciplines of a spiritual seeker. She wandered the country, and whenever people heard she was near, they traveled to seek her wise guidance. Great teacher, one would say, I'm trying to get closer to God. By what path do you travel now? She would ask. I study religious scriptures, reading all the time and working day and night to unlock their mysteries, came the reply. Then, the teacher said, you should put down your books and walk in the woods, thinking nothing but listening deeply. Another person would say, I'm trying to feel whole and true. I do good for every person I meet, doing all that I can to serve their needs. Ah, said the teacher. Then for a time you should consider yourself well done and work to serve your own needs as you have so well served others. One day, the teacher noticed someone in the back of the crowd, someone not pushing his way to her as most others did. She went to him. What is it I can do for you? She asked. I don't really know, he replied. I feel in need of something, but I don't believe in God, and I have nothing you would call a spiritual practice. Well, the teacher said, when do you feel most alive? When I'm playing with my children, the man said without hesitation. Then play with your children, said the teacher, and you will find what you were looking for there. So as the wandering teacher would agree, sometimes what is the best path to take isn't what we expect. Sometimes we need to let go of our own best guesses and our expectations to find what we truly need. So be it. With thanks to Reverend Jennifer Ennis for providing our words for joys and sorrows today, we begin with thoughts from Reverend John Gibb Millspa. Leave aside the little thoughts that distract you from the depths of your soul, for this is a holy place, and now is a holy time. Join with the others in this room, this community of seekers, and together let us find our hearts made lighter by the sharing of our cares. Join us as we share the joys and sorrows, names and milestones among us. We send healing wishes to Bob Beaumont, who is recovering from injuries sustained in a fall. 
and we send thoughts of caring and support to Betty Hall, whose 89-year-old father, John Robertson, is hospitalized with multiple health problems. In our larger world, we send birthday wishes to the great Vietnamese Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh. He turns 94 today. After a long life of compassionate, honest teaching, he is spending his last years in the care of those close to him. We close our sharing of joys and sorrows with words from Thich Nhat Hanh. Breathing in, I calm body and mind. Breathing out, I smile. Dwelling in the present moment, I know this is the only moment. The most precious gift we can offer others is our presence. When mindfulness embraces those we love, they will bloom like flowers. May the sharing of our joys and sorrows be such a gift of presence. May this gift help each of us bloom. Listening with the Heart by Reverend Gary Kowalski. Maybe prayer doesn't mean talking to God at all. Maybe it means just listening, unplugging the TV, turning off the computer, quieting the mental chatter and distractions. Maybe it means listening to the birds and the insects, the wind and the leaves, the creaking and groaning of the trees, noticing who else is out there, not far away, but nearby. Sitting so still we can hear our heartbeat, watch our breath, the gentle whoosh of air, the funny noises from our own insides, marveling at the body we take so much for granted. Maybe it means listening to our dreams, paying more attention to what we really want from life and less attention to all the nagging, scolding voices from our past. Or maybe it's all about listening to each other, not thinking ahead to how we can answer or rebut or parry or advise or admonish, but actually being present to each other. Perhaps if we just sit quietly, we'll overhear a piece whispering through the centuries that's missing from the clamor of the moment. Maybe prayer means listening to the silences between the words, noticing the negativity of space, the vast, undifferentiated and nameless wonder that underlies it all. Maybe prayer doesn't mean talking to God at all, but listening with the heart to the angel choirs all around us. Those who have ears, let them hear.
We begin today's sermon with a reading, first lesson by Philip Booth. Lie back, daughter. Let your head be tipped back in the cup of my hand. Gently, I will hold you. Spread your arms wide, lie out on the stream and look high at the gulls. You will dive and swim soon enough where this tide water ebbs to the sea. Daughter, believe me, when you tire on the long thrash to your island, lie up and survive. As you float now where I held you and let go, remember when fear cramps your heart what I told you. Lie gently and wide to the light year stars. Lie back and the sea will hold you. If you're searching for God in scripture, but struggling to get closer, perhaps it's time to put down your books and walk in the woods. If you're devoting yourself to doing good and serving others' needs, but find yourself exhausted, then perhaps it's time to meet your own needs as you have met the needs of others. If you're searching hard for a spiritual practice, but not connecting to what makes you feel most alive, then perhaps it's time to do what you love and discover there what you seek. In our story this morning, the wandering teacher offers this very wisdom to those who come seeking her guidance. Sometimes in our searching for community, God, the divine justice, we need to adjust our spiritual practice. Sometimes we need to change up our approach and our expectations. This can mean letting go a little and loosening the grip of expectations. It can mean learning to expect surprise. It can mean learning to be more trusting of our place in a larger and interconnected web of existence. Unitarian Universalist and lawyer Adam Gerhardstein learned about adjusting expectations through broken expectations. For him, this had to do with reclaiming his beliefs. Gerhardstein describes how, as a child, his family called him the Count. He counted things. All the sanctuary lights in the church, cars passing on the other side of the road, birds eating on their deck. Sometimes he would announce what he counted, how many birds were on the deck, for example. But he came to wonder if anyone really noticed. He wondered if making those announcements mattered. And somewhere along the line, he began to doubt whether he could have an impact on others by his announcements. Gerhard Stein says, I'm having a spiritual crisis. I'm losing my grip on my expectations. At first, I thought my life had become too segregated. I was simply surrounded by too many people like me. But I think the problem is deeper. I believe that every person is capable of love and greatness. But somehow, that belief is not informing my expectations. I've been hearing a lot of statistics lately. I've been hearing percentages of homes that are owner-occupied, percentages of students who are English language learning or receiving free and reduced lunch, rates of diabetes and obesity among poor folks, different health outcomes for minorities and single-parent families, rates of incarceration for young black men, and that there is something called an achievement gap. I hate that there is an achievement gap, but I fear that I've come to expect it. Gerhard Stein's spiritual crisis eventually led him to embark on a spiritual quest. His quest was to reclaim expectations, a different sort of expectations. He discovered that he wanted his expectations to match his beliefs. Because as much as he believed that every person has the capacity for greatness, 
he realized that he didn't have the same expectations for everyone. He didn't have the same expectations for what a middle-class white kid from southwest Minneapolis and a poor black kid from north Minneapolis could do. The statistics he knew supported his broken expectations. But Gerhard Stein decided to choose his beliefs as his guide. And for him, that meant believing and expecting that everyone has the potential for love and greatness. Sophia Lyon Foss says, some beliefs are like walled gardens. They encourage exclusiveness and the feeling of being especially privileged. Other beliefs are expansive and lead the way into wider and deeper sympathies. Gerhard Stein became determined to expect more. He reclaimed expansive beliefs and widened his expectations. That made space for greater sympathy. Sometimes, like Gerhard Stein, we need to hold on to those expansive beliefs by reclaiming and sometimes by letting go of our expectations. Alice Walker, a wise wandering teacher herself, advises, expect nothing, live frugally on surprise. That's exactly the lesson Unitarian Universalist minister, Reverend Robin Tanner, found she needed. Tanner learned that her expectations were wholly insufficient. An experience showed her that sometimes it's wise to expect nothing. She was traveling to Pennsylvania from New Jersey with a friend and their toddlers. They were going to visit a crayon factory. The traffic was bumper to bumper, and Tanner noticed a minivan approaching too close to her bumper. She hit the brakes because all the cars were slowing and the car behind her inched even closer. Then the honking began. Then the Navy minivan moved between lanes toward the lane beside her. Tanner was preparing herself for what she thought would come next. She says, the minivan approached. I could see the man had rolled down the window on the driver's side and his arm was already out of the, wa the window. I braced myself for a gesture. As the car passed, he made a peace sign and shouted, justice. The man was smiling broadly. I raised my eyebrows in complete confusion. What the heck? It took my friend to remind me that I was driving my wife's car with a Black Lives Matter sticker. Sometimes people surprise you. Sometimes people and communities and life surprise us. Sometimes we need to be surprised out of our self-defeating and other limiting expectations. When we focus our expectations too narrowly, we can squelch the possibilities, even our own beliefs. We can limit growth and grace and love and greatness for ourselves and each other. We can shut ourselves off from what we can't even yet imagine, such as someone driving behind us and applauding, well, honking, in support of our deeply cherished values. Liberal religion reminds us of both, both the need for high expectations and the need to lie back. On the one hand, liberal religion emphasizes the power we humans have to shape reality. Our actions and our expectations give shape to how we see each other and how we see the world. This is the reason our religion teaches us to be engaged, to participate as fully as we can in creating a better world, ensuring justice, love, fairness, and dignity for everyone. We are called to live these values and beliefs in our daily lives, allowing them to be our guiding principles. Yet, on the other hand, our religion also teaches us to be open, 
to learn to let go, to lie back and trust. Our human striving can be exhausting and can even get in the way. After all, we are not in control of everything. Even if we occasionally or often seem to forget that or act otherwise. We are part of a larger whole, interconnected. American poet, essayist, and activist Robert Bly encourages us to think in ways you've never thought before. When someone knocks on the door, think that he's about to give you something large, tell you you're forgiven, or that it's not necessary to work all the time, or that it's been decided that if you lie down for a time, no one will die. This means we need to allow ourselves to trust life and to create space for experiences of transcending wonder and awe, for mystery, for whatever or whoever comes knocking on the door, and even to approach experiences of pain and disappointment with open-heartedness, never knowing where they may lead. In fact, Some of the most meaningful experiences we will have will be the ones we never anticipated and didn't control. They will be the ones we might not even have wanted, might have even resisted mightily, trying to slam the door shut in their faces. The spirit, the muse, serendipity, the universe has a way of showing up for us if we let it. And part of our spiritual practice is to learn to make space for what shows up. When I go to the beach, one of the moments I most cherish is when I'm coming to the crest of a dune. It's that moment just before I can see the water. I can see the expansive sky and feel the warm sand between my toes, and I know the water is there. I can hear it. I can smell the salt air and see the seagulls. And then there's that moment when the water rises into my view. I like to pause then, there on the threshold of an encounter with the ocean, with the sacred source of life. No matter how many times I look at the ocean, it never fails to surprise me. The ocean is not predictable. Life is not predictable. As much as we try to push and pry it into what we think it will be or ought to be, life, like the water, is ever shifting in color, shape, texture, size of swells, roughness, and calm, ever calling us to adapt our expectations raising them or releasing them, ever calling us to balance what we know with what we have yet to learn, to balance our striving with trust in something greater than ourselves, to know that we are the ones we've been waiting for, but we are not the only ones, to know that struggles and disappointments can give way to healing. In the words of our chalice lighting this morning, may the time we share today make space for greater expectation. May the truth we learned yesterday be changed by what we hear today. May the fear that seems so certain be loosened by a newfound trust. May our doubts and disappointments be replaced by an ever-unfolding faith in more beauty, more trust, more joy, more goodness, more life. As a people of expectation, may we be called into an ever-unfolding openness to the forces that create and uphold life. May we be called to answer yes to life to say yes to life, 
to say yes to truth and to love and to beauty and even to struggle. To remember that, as Philip Booth offers as a first lesson, when fear cramps your heart, lie gently and wide to the light your stars. Lie back and the sea will hold you. May we set our hearts to building a better, kinder world, and also to trusting that none of us needs to do it by ourselves, nor can any of us. If we were to loosen our too tight grip on expectations, who knows what surprises might greet us? Perhaps that might be the greatest of expectations. Amen. Blessed be. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Go now in peace. Deeply regard each other. Truly listen to each other. Speak what each of you must speak. Be ready in any moment to disarm your own heart and always live as if a realm of love had begun. So be it. Blessed be. Amen. <laughs>